Good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us. We know that uh, we know that um, Friday at five thirty is not an ideal time for anyone. Um, we will try to honor and be respectful of your time, uh, and we'll try to get you out of here in the next hour and a half. Um, let me introduce myself. I'm Francisco Garcia. I'm the director of the Pima County Health Department. And PAC is part of the portfolio of responsibilities that I oversee. And I'm going to be your facilitator today. Um, let me just give you a little bit of background. Uh, the reason that we're having this meeting is because a lot of really good questions were asked during our last meeting. Um, we realized fairly quickly that our volunteers have a very different level of knowledge in terms of the degree of sophistication, you guys, uh, our volunteers are, are pretty sophisticated and ask very sort of pointed questions, and we want to be responsive to that. We also want to be responsive to our um, uh, rescue partners who also have some fairly technical questions that they want to have addressed in this process. And so that's the reason why we're having this session today. Um, and I anticipate, and Kristen and I have talked about this, that we will want to probably continue to have some conversations with you guys about it. I don't know about you, but I've never built a big building like this, and to me the whole process has been a really tremendous education in terms of what a complicated process. Come on in, got my chairs. Um, it's, it's actually a pretty complicated process. And so, and so I'm, gonna, I'm gonna ask us to take a step back and to walk through all the different components of where we have been and where we are today. I'm also going to ask you guys to, um, we have some comment cards or question cards that we are passing out. They look like this. I'm going to ask you, at least initially, I'd like to try to get through a fairly busy agenda. At least initially, jot down your, jot down your questions. Um, and then we're going to try to collect them. I'm going to ask one of you, um, Marcy or Jack or someone to help us sort of put all these questions together and group them so that everybody's voices get heard, everybody's questions get asked uh, and at least addressed. We may not have all the answers today, but we're going to do our best of telling you the story of where we are at this moment. So, um, so please use this as, the, as where you're going to put your questions. Um, at the end of the at the at the end of the, the kind of pre-scheduled program, we will have. That's when we'll look at all these. That's when we can sort of take up some random um, questions that, that might not have struck you at the moment that you started to do this, um, at, but that may be um, sort of in your mind now after you've synthesized all of this. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. cool. So, so by way of trying to very quickly sort of um, get through this process, I'm going to ask you guys to sort of just go around the room and very quickly say who you are and and what you do. Heather Lewis, Animal Arts. Janae Wagner, UC Davis, Prep Shelter Medicine Program. So. I'm Justin Barrio with PAC. Marty Poe, Community County Facilities. Bob Clements with Line and Space for the Architects. Sherry Jacobs, dog walker. <laughs> Ken Silver, volunteer. Marcy Vallon, of Filipino County. Charlie Vandenberg, volunteer. Debbie Gallon, dog walker. Jan Pini, tech volunteer. Uh, ben McCurson, dog walker. Volunteer. I'm Mike England, I'm the project architect for the project from Lion Space and also volunteer. I'm Sarah Bowman, animal arts. <coughs> Michael Berg, I'm Director of Facilities Management. Henry Tom, I'm a Line and Space Architect. Jose Ocano, PAC. Julie Newhouse, volunteer. Eric Newhouse, uh, volunteer groomer. Kathy Newman, volunteer. Jack Newman, volunteer. Bill Sermon, Paul Walker Spice. Carol Minoki, cat volunteer. Bob Minoki, chauffeur. <laughs> uh, Justin Pope, uh, dog walker, help desk volunteer, and a rescue also. Awesome. David Downey, volunteer. I'm Deirdre Downey, volunteer. Susie Sargent, volunteer. Nancy Young Wright, that, that can say my own name. Nancy Young Wright, dog walker adoption person, volunteer. 
97 volunteer. Joe Anderson, volunteer dog walker. Shirley Green, volunteer dog walker mentor. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. <laughs> this woman was my host mother when I stayed in uh, Japan when I was 13 years old. And she, <laughs> just, she just flew in this afternoon. So. <laughs> Jim Dean volunteer. Lori Dean volunteer. Catherine Gordon volunteer for the veterinarian. Stephanie Yuckin, uh, cat care, socialization, and off site adoptions. Kayla Anderson volunteer. Amelia Castellanos, Chinese caregiver. Jim Shirley, the president of People for Animals. And I'm also a member of the Human Animal Care Center Advisory. Uh, put more in it, awesome. Well, uh, thank you so much, and, and I think we've got the right. A, thank you. It, it wears my heart that people want to do this on a Friday afternoon. Um, B, um, thank you for being out here. It, from what I hear, we got the right population, which was a combination of volunteer and rescue groups, um, and so that's what we wanted to make sure we address. So I'm going to um, turn the. Um, program over to budget um, and um, and then and actually to Chris, were you going to say something? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Quickly, so there's a couple things that um, I was going to say that Francisco didn't hit on, just so you guys know too, in case you didn't see, there's two different versions of this um, mm -hmm. FAQ sheet that we sent out earlier, but if you want either of those, they're on the back table there. Thank you guys so much for being here, really appreciate it. The, the FAQs were one of the sort of critical pieces that we thought we better start putting together so that we all, at least you could hear consistently from us what what was what we were saying. So I'm going to turn it over to Marty um, because he's going to talk about two things that are kind of complicated uh, and that gives me headaches. And that is there were some fairly fairly uh, pointed questions about the budget. And we want to be very clear and transparent about the budget. And then there were some really important questions about the design process. So I'll advance the slides for you. Or okay, right here. Yeah. All right, the budget. Everybody has questions about the money. So um, I wanted to share with everybody just not exactly what portion of the budget goes to which portion of the project. And um, I think what a lot of people talked about numbers, what's the construction of the facility, think numbers get mixed up on what's construction and what, act, what are other costs. One of, the, one of the terms that we use in the industry is soft costs. And those are costs that go towards things that aren't the building, that aren't the site development, those kinds of tasks. Um, so what I did, at facilities we have a, I hope this isn't too small, but um, we use seven categories to break it down. As everybody knows, the, the bottom is approved at $22 million. And these seven categories are land acquisition, project development, design, construction, utilities, public art, and contingency. And out of that $22 million, you can see, I'll skip down to the construction line, which is at a little over $16 million, um, which is over about 73% of our, our project budget. That construction budget, will include, besides the construction of the facility, all the IT infrastructure, it includes a lot of the equipment, it includes the furniture. And it's also important to note that's the construction of the entire project. That's the new, that's the renovated portion. It's all lumped in there. Mm -hmm. It's is, is all considered uh, that one number. Um, we did, the bond did talk about land acquisition, so we have um, some money set aside there to buy property that's been um, a great advantage to us and a, a worthwhile investment. Um, there's some project development costs that um, are some bond expenses and some environmental, some federal and state environmental compliance that we're required to do. Um, and then and design fees. So we have fees to pay our architects. We have fees for our, our um, animal care consultants. We have uh, permitting fees. There's a lot of there's quite a few items that go in this category, but they're kind of construction and design related tasks. But they don't they're not necessarily that vertical that the facility that you see the, the bricks and mortar, for lack of a better term. Um, there's some utility costs there. 
you can see, and then public art, Pima County has a 1% a requirement of the project budget um, that's dedicated to public art, so that's that, that line there. And then lastly is our contingency. So one of the most important parts of my job is to make sure that the project keeps moving forward and we, we can anticipate any unforeseen conditions or any hiccups. So what we do, and we call that risk, and the way we manage that is by having a contingency fund. And we, anytime anything comes up that wasn't expected, um, we pull from that fund and we, and we use that money so we can keep moving with the project. Well, we, now this money doesn't just sit there and, and remain idle the whole time. So as the project progresses and the risk is lowered, we're able to take that money and apply it to the project. And really where it gets applied to is the construction category. That's where we want to spend it. We don't want to spend money on things that, that, that you don't see and you don't, you don't get a direct benefit from. So, but that's really just to protect the project and make sure at the end of the day, we're not on hold for any unforeseen conditions. So that's the budget in a, kind of a small, uh, abbreviated format. I don't know if you want to take questions or just keep moving. Dr. Garcia, do you want to get a little moving? Okay, we'll keep moving. So, um, next I, I wanted to put together something about kind of talking about our process, where we're at on this, where we're at in the project. And this is kind of a, a simple diagram. At least I thought it was simple, but it kind of explains our, 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 our main steps in developing the project, the design until we start construction. So you can see here we have um, general categories, which starts out with programming. That was when we had our workshop with stakeholders. I think um, several uh, members of this group here in the room were involved with those. And we developed our architectural design program, which is available on the uh, internet. That's kind of our basis of design, our reference point. Um, the next piece is, was concept design, which is what we showed um, to you all and the, and the public um, last month. And that, that really was the big idea of the project. Um, one of the things I, I think I heard was um, people thought we were done designing at that point, but it was really just getting all, all the parts and pieces on the site and understanding how they all fit together, generally how big they are, and getting an idea. It's kind of the big ideas what I put on there and kind of show the organization of the facility and the way we're kind of approaching the project. And then you can see here um, where we're at today. So right now we're in what we call schematic design. And that's when we take that, that um, concept design, we start to really pick it apart and look at the detail of it. We bring in engineers, we, we check it with our, um, our, our experts, our animal care experts, the architects are doing that. Um, we also are having discussions with our contractor to try to see what's buildable, how much things cost, and try to get um, their input on it at that point. From here, we move into a lot, a lot of real detailed design, what we call design development, and then we, we start charging into um, trying to produce construction documents which a contractor will build off of. And at that time, I'm kind of showing this one, the detail, level of detail is, is really increasing almost exponentially. Um, I mean, at, at this early stage, we kind of just know where things are going, how big they are, where they're at, but we're still refining a lot of that. So, and throughout this process, we've been taking comments from you all, um, and we've been trying to incorporate those into the design as best we see fit. Um, early on, we've been taking kind of some of the, the larger, um, bigger picture comments, and but a lot of those decisions are made early on, and as we, as we develop the, develop the project, a lot of those decisions are already made. Um, we're trying to make the best decisions for the project. But we're continually taking comments. There's a, um, a hyperlink online where that uh, emails me directly, I think Kristen as well. And what I do is I take those comments and I forward them on to the design team and we evaluate those comments um, as best we see fit. Um, unfortunately, we can't incorporate every idea but we take every idea and consider it against the design. And I want to give some examples of some stakeholder input that is made into the current design. And these were 
these were ideas we heard either during our programming session or um, at the volunteer or the public open house um, or even just things that have come in online. And one of them was clear organized wayfinding with separate entries for intake and adoption. And that, that was a big concern a lot of people had just out there right now. It's very difficult for people to find their way around. Species separation throughout the facility. And that's something we're continually working on. It's, um, as I review the plan, it's very challenging and complex. And so you have to really vet out each area and, and where, where the flow through the facility. There's a flow diagram that we have with the concept, with the concept design. So we're, we're checking all those areas to make sure we, we, we meet that goal. Indoor outdoor kennels, that was a, a big request. And we increased the percentage by about 650% uh, more kennels will have indoor, will be indoor outdoor versus the indoor indoor style. Another big area was what are the components of the renovation? There's been a lot of questions here, but areas that we're addressing specifically are the kennel drains, the chain link kennels, replacing those, bringing in natural light and into, the, into that area, um, increased adoption areas specifically in the kennels, addressing the noise issue, and also creating kennels that are divisible. So those are some specific areas that we are addressing with the renovation. Uh, a couple other areas are increased exercise, meet and greet areas. Those are incorporated in the design. A multi-purpose room for training and different events. That was a big comment that came up repeatedly. And then also increasing the cat area. That was a question a lot of people had. Um, the cat area is um, nearly three times as big as what it is now and, and much more functional. So those are some, so those are some ways we've taken the input and um, we, we evaluated the um, against the design to see if we can incorporate it because that's that's what we want to do we want to make sure we take all that input at least at least take a look at it um, and the, the last thing i want to address is um there's been a lot of numbers thrown out there from early on like how big is the facility um you know the numbers in the 70s numbers in the 60s some people said they heard it's not much bigger same thing with the number of kennels and how many dogs it can hold and what I want to say was, it's tough to give exact numbers because it's continually changing. Just how this, just like this line is it's showing up as we get into more and more detail. We're refining the plan, so a number we had a month ago isn't going to be the same number we had today. We're, we're continually making changes. Hopefully those changes are becoming smaller and smaller. But that's the reason why we try to give approximate numbers, approximately 65,000. Right now we're seeing approximately 63,000. So um, if you hear different numbers, it's not that um, we're incorrect with the number or we're hiding something or, or somebody got the wrong information, but it's just things are continually changing. Those changes are, are minimizing as we move further along, but um, that's why we try to give, like I said, give approximate numbers or give percentages because they are, it's tough to pull out a number and, and say that's, this is what it's going to be from here on to the day we build. We won't, we won't really know how big it is until the day we start construction. <laughs> really, exactly how big it is. But we're, and that's, that's all I have. I'm going to ask Mike to sort of come up, and, and Mike does a really tough job for the county in, in that he manages all of our facilities, both the new ones that are coming up and the existing ones. and and. One of the things that I didn't understand um, very well was um, how to start thinking about some of the sustainability issues that are inherent in building these kinds of large projects and how do you build a, a building that kind of responsibly uses utilities and stuff like that. And, and he's, a, he's a big picture guy, so that's why I wanted him to, to be here today. Right. Thank you. Now, how many of you actually had some time before the election or even since to read the bond language. <laughs> God bless you. <laughs> because that's part of my responsibility because it gives for us a direction and a scope for the project. And I've been a part of a lot of different bonds in a lot of different jurisdictions. But one of the things I really appreciated about the bond document that was put out for this 
FEMA animal care facility was the fact that its focus was all about efficiency and performance. I mean, if you read the language, more than it was about a building, it talks about square footage, it talks about the different things that need to be incorporated, it talks about performance, that the end result would have a certain type of performance. One of the things that's been charged to me as uh, director of facilities management is the fact that this facility, even though we will probably increase it by what, 60, 65 percent in square footage, its operation and maintenance uh, costs have to be the same. That's, a, that's a, 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 a tremendous task that we have, but one that we feel very confident that we will accomplish. And so when you talk about performance, you're talking about that in thinking about customers, people, and particularly for this facility, animals. And so what we have done is, is that we focus on the performance from the beginning. It's in the bond language and it has been a charge to us and a mandate given to you, us by you as well as uh, people in the community that we need to make this focus on performance. And so when you talk about it from a facility management, you talk about business performance, you're talking about three things, people, processes, and place. And for design, it's a matter of how do I integrate that to be able to, to have a business performance. And so what we're looking at is we've gone through a process of looking at people, uh, we're looking at people, we're looking at processes in place, and, we, and the design process is made to get at all of that and to integrate it. When it comes to people, I mean, we, we've really gone out to get the various perspective of different stakeholders that were part of this facility and that will be a part of this facility. We've talked to the staff, we've talked to volunteers, we've talked to partners, uh, community. We, we've gathered all that information in order that we can see all of the various uh, perspectives that the people who have some type of uh, relationship or will have some type of relationship with this facility and with the staff. Uh, what, are, what are their perspectives? What are the things that they see that we need to integrate into the design. So we, we really spent a lot of time in gathering people and we'll continue throughout the process of connecting and engaging people to get information. And so people has been a high part of this because we know that's a component of performance. But then also process. One of the wonderful things about this facility is that before we even, we ever went and, and, and to, to the taxpayers and, and got them to vote on this, that when we were having discussions of you know, what could happen once that was approved with, uh, with uh, PAC staff, one of the things that came out that was just wonderful for me, because I was saying, hey, we, we, we probably would need to do something because we want a, we want a, a high performance, cutting edge type facility, so we need to spend some time on process improvement. And what they said back to me, because I was the new guy on the block, we've been doing that. And for me, that was exciting because they already started looking at their processes, understanding that guess what, we have a unique opportunity here. The facility that's out there, the original facility was built, when we start the construction of this, will be almost 50 years old. Once we build this, it will probably be another 50 years before we build another animal care facility. And so it's so important that Guess what? We look at how we operate, how our processes, and how we deliver our services in order to design and put together a, a, a facility that will support the best that we can do and, 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 and enhance the services that we're providing to the community. But then also, place is a big part of this. We, we look at the people, we gather information from the people who are the stakeholders, we, we look at the processes and how we can improve them and make them better in order that we can translate that into a place that support both the people and the processes. But from a facility standpoint, my thing is, is that I know not only on the front end, which is the design and construction, the planning, design and construction of the facility, out on the back end, after it's been built and it occupied, it's been occupied, out on the, the operation and maintaining of that facility. So our approach from a facility standpoint has always been total cost of ownership. 
So what we're doing is balancing the fact that, yeah, we're going to design this, but we have to design this in a way that it will last. And something that happened along the way that reinforced that we really have to focus on that is I had an opportunity to talk to some people from Pinell County. And they, they had recently built a facility. And they were telling me about the nightmare because they went cheap. That's what they did. They went cheap. And, you know, a few months after it was built, they already was developing problems because they weren't looking at the total cost of ownership. How do we build this? We want it to be state of the art, but then we also want it to be built to last and be built with quality. And so that's a responsibility that we have as, as a facility uh, management is to make sure that occurs. So as we look at as we look at performance, we're looking at people, processes, and place and integrating them for performance, but we don't just want any type of performance. What we're looking for is high performance. And the question is, then how do you move from just performance to high performance? And that's very, very simple. Best practices. What we look at and what we have been doing through all of this is looking at best practices. Best practices as it relates to how you utilize the people, best practices as it relates to how customers come into the building, best practices as it relates to how we care for the animals. We're looking at best practices because if we want to move just from just performing and a building that performs and a staff that performs and move to high performance, we've got to incorporate the best practices. And so we spend a lot of time from a facility standpoint, from a staff stand standpoint, from an animal care standpoint, to look at all of what are the best practices that we can incorporate into this facility. And so what we are looking to do is to pick the proven best practices. I like Yogi Bear because you know everything he says is really interesting. See, we don't we're not theoretically building a building. We are building a building and incorporating proven practices, best practices, around the globe. Because they've already gone through the test and we know that they work. We know that they work and because they work, we want them to be a part of this facility to make it not just a performing facility, but make it a high performing facility. And so, how does that apply to this project? When you talk about people, it applies in the fact that we've engaged so many people to get ideas and get, get to identify needs, but then to also go out into the industry of animal care and figure out what are those best practices around these ideas. As it relates to processes, PAC has been working on all of their processes, evaluating them, changing them, trying to see even the ones that they can incorporate even before we build the facility. As it relates to place, well, we have very good consultants that are engaged with the facilities management department and with PAC to make sure that the, the place that we are going to create will be a place that will support the people and the processes and that in the end, it all comes out as high performance. And the reason that it comes out as high performance is, is as we look at best practices, whether we're talking about for the people, place, or processes, we realize one thing in this, and that is as we move forward, we also have to change some of our approaches. We have to change the approach of how we look at how we've done this business. And so for us, what helps us, because I've, I've built a couple billion dollars worth of facilities for government. But I've never built an animal care facility. Uh, you know, Lion and Space are very, very talented, very, very innovators, very, very good architects. But they haven't built one. And so what we have done and what they have done is brought along with us for this journey people who understand those best practices, that they can share those with us. I mean, not just anybody, but when I looked at their list of consultants, I was saying, man, this is a winning team. And so what they have pro provided to us is they will help us get from 
just performance to high performance. And what we have to do is, as we embrace those best performances, that means we probably have to let go of some of our past performances. And so that's the process that we're doing as we develop this, is to go, what's going to work? What's proven? And that we need to incorporate that in order to make PAC a high-performing business and make this building a high-performing facility. And so what we want to talk about is one of those approaches that we've changed or looked at that's a best practice and why we are going to incorporate it into this building in order that it can support the work that we have to do in animal care. So I'm going to ask that Dr. Wagner come up and that she would talk about a new approach that we use in making some decisions already about the design. Thank you. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about right-sizing the shelter facility because this is the basis for which we, which everything is built upon, and that is the housing units, the number of housing units that were put in there. Um, this has a tremendous um, uh, length of stay, capacity for care, and the life-saving success for sheltering organizations. Right-sizing the facility, length of stay has an integral part to do with that. Um, What's the goal of this new facility? What do we want this facility to do for, for uh, Pima County? We want, we want to perform at a very high level, keep animals healthy and happy while they're in the shelter. We want to improve efficiency and ease, uh, ease of use for staff and for volunteers, and for the public using it as well. We want to get animals out alive. It's a high goal for us um, as consultants and as a community. The last two are a little nebulous. We won't, we, you probably don't think a ton about this when we're in the facility, and, and is, that is to keep animals safely in their homes. But the, I'll come back to this a little bit later, as well as this one, which is to minimize costs, to free up more to spend on getting animals out alive and keeping them in their home. That's what we want this facility to do. What is the right quality to achieve these goals? Is quality of housing where animals are kept? This is the basis of this facility. That animals are going to spend the majority of their time in their housing units, so their housing units have to meet their needs. Yes. We are going to get the animals out. You guys are walking the dogs. Cats get sometimes some out of cage time, but a lot of times that's where they, they spend their time while they're in the shelter facility. So a majority of the animals' time is going to be in their housing units. We've got to make sure that those housing units meet the need, needs of the animals. So it's got to be adequate size. Where is the pointer on this guy? <laughs> Oh, that one. <laughs> the other one. Thank you. There we go. So we want adequate size housing, um, and all of our housing meets the needs of the of the animals of the species that we have or exceeds it. Double compartment housing. You're familiar with double compartment housing. You've got some double ke double sided kennels. We don't have a ton of them in the current facility. Every single housing unit for dogs and cats is going to be double compartment. This is a basic need of dogs and cats, and that's what they will have for individual housing. We do have some group housing for cats, um, so, but the basis of this facility is double compartment housing. We want a good environment, and that means that's everything that we surround the cats with. The cats, the dogs, the small mammals, the animals that are in there, we want to surround them with a good environment. So that's natural lighting, low noise, good air quality, um, proper temperature, etc., etc. We want them comfortable and safe. Additionally, we want a variety of choices for the animals in their environment, so that's within their housing unit. But we also want a variety for those people using this facility, primarily the adopters. We um, presenting animals in the same way does not move animals out of facilities, does not get them adopted. <coughs> 
adopters come in with different backgrounds and different needs, and presenting animals in a variety of ways helps us move them through quickly, so that's going to be incorporated in this facility. And again, housing, it has a daily impact on care. If we have good quality housing, we will make care much easier, animals will remain healthy, they'll move through the facility much better, we have less cost of care, we'll decrease stress and illness, much more adaptable. And for animals in a shelter facility, that's life and death for them. So that was the quality of, of housing. I want to talk a little bit about the quantity of housing, because this is critical for a facility, especially of this size. But I have two, two facilities. I have a facility that has a capacity of 100 animals on the left, and 200 animals um, on the right, and that's within, that's their inventory. Which one costs more to run each day? Which one it costs more to operate? Yep. The bigger facility costs more on a day-to-day -day basis. Which one serves more animals a year? Do you need more information? <laughs> Right. You need more information because if I tell you that the large facility has a length of stay, the animals have a length of stay of 20 days, average length of stay of 20 days, and the small facility has an average length of stay of 10 days, they're equal. They serve the same number of animals. So what we want to do is we want a right sized facility. So we want a facility that's built to meet the needs of the community, enough good quality housing to hold the number of animals coming in each day for the shortest length possible in order to get them the right outcome, the very best outcome that we can. So that's how this facility is going to be done. And this comes back to this concept of length of stay. General, in a general statement, shorter length of stay is better for the animal's health and welfare. Animals do much better, remain more adaptable, are, more, are healthier with shorter lengths of stay. Where do we need time? We need time for their hold. We need to give them the proper hold time. We need to give them the proper time to settle in. Time for treatments if, if that is needed, and medical services, spay and neuter, etc. And we need to give them enough time to be seen to be adopted or moved out to rescue or whatever the appropriate outcome is for that animal. Housing health and length of stay. Um, the housing that we have selected meets animals' needs and it's adequately sized, it's double compartment. And this is really important for reducing stress and animal disease because we have less handling with double compartment housing, we have less risk for disease spread. And this is just a picture from our visit this, this summer, but the housing that you currently have it really works against you. We've got a dog that's in the back there that has gotten loose. So we've, we've got another dog over here that's getting exposure, some contact with that dog. We've got a dog that's sitting in this little crate um, that's also getting some contact. We've got people tied up trying to take care of this situation. We have a staff member waiting to come through this area, but they have to wait until this gets taken care of. But this, this is just basically the housing that's provided. That, that's a guarantee you can't. That, that happens. That just happens with this type of housing. Double compartment housing will greatly reduce this situation from here. Excuse me, what is double compartment? Double compartment housing, you know the housing in your isolation area? the front part of the kennel, a guillotine door, and then the back kennel? Yeah, I think so. That's double compartment housing. It gives animals two compartments, basically. A place where their bed, food, and water can be, and then a place for them to eliminate and go potty. And it, ha it has a usually a door, whether it's a pass-through or a transfer door, a guillotine door for dogs, might be a portal for cats. <coughs> Thank you for asking that. <laughs> So less animal stress, less disease, reduces length of stay in the facility. So we're 
wanting to be able to move these guys out quickly. This is a facility um, comment from a director um, in Vancouver, British Columbia. The biggest surprise with improving our cat housing was going from isolation being full all the time to isolation looking like this all the time. This, the only thing that was changed is the housing in this facility. And improving their cat housing resulted in no cats without a respiratory infection, basically. This is housing stress and length of stay. Again, housing stress and health are linked together, but housing has an effect on animal stress. And adequately sized, double compartment housing reduces stress, encourages friendly behavior in dogs and cats. Adopters respond to friend animals showing friendly active behavior. This, um, this study was one that we did with dogs. These were shelter dogs, double compartment housing, looking at where they preferred to uh, eliminate, where they preferred to defecate and urinate. And this bar right here, shows that dogs prefer to urinate opposite of where their bed, food and water is, so in the side that's away from them, as well as urinate away. And the smaller bars are when they went potty on the same side as their bed, food and water. So the vast majority of the time, they want, their desire is to eliminate away from where their bed, food and water is. The lower graph, sorry these are so small, but this is another study we did in cats housed in a single compartment, a two by two stainless steel cage, and then a double compartment housing unit, about twice that size, they were about four foot cages. <coughs> the green line is the stress scores. These were observed, observed stress scores in the cats. The red line, uh, the green line is large cages. I can't hold my hands so, um, The red is small, the small cage. And that blue line across, the middle is the um, stress score of cats below which they're relaxed. So we watch them on, this is entry into the shelter, day one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one week in the shelter. By day two, these cats that were in the large cage, by day two, there, there was a significant difference between those cats housed in a little bit bigger, double compartment housing, unit than the cats in their 2 by 2 cage. And never during that first week did those cats in the small housing units show reduced stress to what we would expect for a, a cat going out for adoption, really below a three sort of observed score. So housing has a tremendous impact on stress levels. And then housing, staff time, and length of stay. I just want to back up one second. If we're having to make decisions on what cats are going to go out for adoption, when, when can we make a, a decision on that cat in a small cage? We're, we're out a week and they're not even showing signs. Or would a doctor select a cat that's stressed? Less, much less likely than a cat that's in an adequately sized housing unit. So these guys are showing their true colors much sooner than those other cats. Double compartment housing much more efficient for daily care. The staff that spend less time cleaning and more quality time with the animals, as well as having time to interact with the people that are going to be adopting. And we have a we don't have as much staff uh, adopter interaction, but wherever we can free up staff time to do other things, to move our to do those things we want, to move our animals through our system is going to be important. And that's going to help us reduce our length of stay. This is a quality one-on-one -on -one time, um, talking to adopters, spending time getting these animals moving through. There are management considerations with length of stay as well. Admission by appointment to match intake of animals with the staffing and housing that we have. We have times of year when we have peak, you know, peak um, numbers of animals coming in, and if we can blunt those off a little bit, we can make our facility function better. And this is not limiting intake, we are just providing more control so they may not come, maybe they don't need to come in today. If they need to come in, they'll come in, 
But if they don't need to come in today, we'll have them come in by appointment. So, um, ability of adopters and rescues to view animals from day one. This is open selection. This is how this facility has been designed. Open selection so that there is still a hold period, but these animals are in an area, um, as long as they're healthy, um, and uh, uh, like the stray, the stray animals would go into the part of the facility where there is public, where they can be viewed publicly. They would still have their hold period, but once their hold period is up, if someone has decided they want that animal, it can move very quickly. Actually, even before their hold period is up, they can be um, requested so that when their hold period is up and if they have, if they have not been um, returned to their owner, if there is an owner in their um, history, they can be moved out of the facility very quickly. It helps to uh, shorten lengths of stay tremendously. Um, short stray hold for unidentified animals to live outcome. So if an animal comes in and they do not have any ID, their length of stay um, can be shorter whatever the state requirement is. I'm not sure where we're at right now. I think it's, we can have a three day hold on dogs, three day straight hold, is that correct? Yes. So, um, depends, up to seven if they have a Yeah, so if they have, idea, if they have ID, if they have ID, then we'll extend out their, their, their hold period will be extended out. And, this helps to encourage ID for own pets, it helps people make sure that their pets are ID, they, they should be ID. And it reduces the waiting time for live outcomes. So we can get animals through, the, this is imperative that we move animals through the facility on their pathway, always moving to their appropriate outcome. Active management of each animal stay. This ensures, and this is this path moving along its pathway, ensuring efficient facility with adequate staff and volunteer support so that there's no delays in service or minimize bottlenecks so that animals are consistently moving to their appropriate health. Putting it all together, a right-sized facility meets each animal's health, welfare, and life-saving needs in the most efficient way. It's imperative that we make it as efficient as we possibly can. <laughs> This increased efficiency means more time and money to keep animals safely in their home. It frees up resources um, to further the shelter's mission and goals. Animals safely in their homes reduce the shelter intake, which means lower cost and less facility need, which frees up resources. You repeat as necessary. Basically, keep the ball rolling in a positive motion. Thank you. Thank you so much. You can see why we thought that it was critical for us to have Fred be part of the Line and Space team and why we were so enthusiastic when, when Line and Space um, brought them on board and brought our, our next presenter from Animal Art. I'll, I'll tell you that, that I was not involved in the selection process at all. I know Nancy and Kristen, some other people here were. Um, but. Um, but what was most dramatic to me as I was as I was participating in some of the workshops um, that really sort of got me enthusiastic was looking at some of the stuff that our colleague from Animal Arts is going to show us in terms of how you could really transform spaces. Um, I, I'm not having been somebody that grew up with animals. I really sort of have come to this kind of the, the long way. Um, and it was it was very very neat the kinds of stuff that, that you showed us. Do you want to? Oh, oh, and the other thing I was going to say is um, um, for those of you who, who just got here or are walking in, there's these little Manila cards, and we'd love for you to grab them and to to make your comments, put your questions there. We're going to collect them. We're going to try to make sure everybody's questions get answered in one form or another, um, so they're in the back. But I'm sorry to take the time. Yeah, um, I just want to sort of give a little lead into Heather because I understand um, as a volunteer out of PAC, um, all of the negative sentiment that surrounds the existing facility and I also understand why it was a shock to some of you when you heard that we were reusing that. 
Um, but I also want to communicate to you that it's not being viewed as a sort of leftover piece of the project. If anything, it's a higher priority because we know we've got to make drastic improvements in that area um, to bring it up to an acceptable standard and to, to help change the, the public and volunteer perception of that area. Um, so although we don't know and we can't show you an image because we're not far enough in the process yet to show you what that space is going to look like, we do want to reassure you that some of those priorities that Marty outlined, fixing the drainage, getting rid of the, um, the chain link that put a hole in my own uh, volunteer shirt, um, you know, making that not a depressing space like it feels like now, getting natural light in there, improving the acoustics, um, those are high priority aspects of the project. It's not a situation of we're throwing a bunch of money at the new construction and, and if there's something left over, we're going to do something in that existing space. And um, some of the feedback we got after the last presentation was that uh, that was the worry, that, that people thought that was the situation. Um, it's definitely not. And like I said, we're not far enough in the process to show you an image of what those spaces are going to look like, but they are going to incorporate all those aspects that Marty brought up. And we asked Heather of Anna Wards today to bring examples of where she's dealt with similar situations. So although this isn't specific to PAC, we are able to show you some before and after so you can hopefully see even in spaces that were as bad as the, the back me for PAC, that they can be made into great spaces for, for animals and volunteers and the public. So that I'll hand it over to Heather. <laughs> so we are early in our process and the vast majority of the animal housing and the human areas of the facility are being fully new, uh, allocated as fully new. But there is still a component that is a remodel component, um, and you all have been educated as to uh, the decision-making um, process there. But the important thing is that we are looking at that remodel component with even more attention to detail than the new components. Because when you start with a new component, you can really have a blank like, slate. And when you're starting with a remodel component, uh, you do have to evaluate all the decisions pretty carefully. So fortunately, um, animal care facilities around the nation really have to address these same issues. Um, they're expensive buildings to build, and during the recession, there were a huge number of facilities that went through a remodel process in lieu of building new. Um, so fortunately, we have a lot of resources from recently constructed facilities where we can look at how those remodels have been effective, what they've accomplished, and really with the goal that they accomplish the same thing as the new facilities uh, will do and preserve some of the resources, just the concrete and the, the envelope of that building uh, without preserving some of the things you would prefer not to preserve. So what I'd like to show you is uh, some of those examples. In fact, this is such a common issue that the ASPCA now funds grants for this type of remodel project for animal care facilities around the nation. And we just participated with the very first group that went through that grant process, so I'm going to show you that as one of the case studies. So really, one of the issues that we face in animal care, and I'm sp focusing specifically on dogs because that's the, the area of renovation, is that housing depends on the dog. Just as you prefer to be in a specific type of space and make specific decisions that are individual to you, the same thing is true of a dog. And what's true of the dog on the right might not be true about the dog on the left. And one of the things that I appreciate about how this facility is evolving and how we're talking together is acknowledging that need, that dogs do have different needs. You know, a chihuahua is going to have a different need from a much larger dog. And so we can look at the different housing that we're providing and making sure that we are meeting the needs of these different types of animals. 
So I want to show you a few case studies of kind of before and afters from other facilities and, and just talk about them briefly. I know you've listened to a lot of people talk, but hopefully this will help. I love being part of this process um, with today's resources that we have available to us. So we can talk about best practices. We also know that anything you want to do with dog housing, we can do now. All the manufacturers provide all these different options at the same cost. So they're all tired of ask, as architects asking, well, we want bars here, and we want solid here, and we want glass here, and we want this here. So they just make it, it's pretty much all at our fingertips. So what we can do with those housing units. So this is the Erie SDCA in Buffalo. And this is kind of what the runs look like, uh, looked like before they were remodeled. And I'm sure you recognize those components. Uh, and this is what they look like after. This was quite an extreme remodel uh, where the rooms were fully enclosed, um, but that was the same space just remodeled to fully enclose those rooms. The important components uh, of this remodel were really addressing the noise control of that space, which we're going to really focus on with you as well, uh, so that it's not so much cacophony for the dogs and the human beings and the staff and the volunteers that were in there. Uh, addressing any kind of natural lighting. So that was one of the things you brought up, materials for sanitation and appropriate housing. So really, those are our focus, the key components that we need to focus on. In this case, that um, renovation approved their adoptions by 30%, not just for dogs, but for cats as well, because people have an overall impression of a facility as you know. This is a case study we're currently working on right now with the Alpha Humane Society in Florida. Ticks are literally dropping out of the ceiling. It's, uh, it is quite, <laughs> quite something. But this facility received a grant from the ASPCA, and they're an amazing organization. They're the only open admission shelter in North Florida. And you can imagine the number of animals that come through that facility. So they received that grant. It is currently under construction, so you can't show you a, a photo of after. But down on the bottom right, um, we are creating uh, some much better materials. We are creating color in the space. We're vastly improving the lighting. We are creating opportunities for the dogs to hide from each other across the aisle by creating some solid panels. Um, and I'm having the same point of issue. Oh, I got it. Yeah. So, so instead of the front being just chain link, the front of the kennel has uh, bars at the bottom, glass at the top, and a solid panel, where the dog can have a choice of, re of retreating or hiding or coming forward uh, depending on their personality. And again, housing needs to suit that dog. We also um, stagger those so they're not staring across the aisle at each other. One thing that we have learned from dogs is that if you, if you just say, okay, we're going to put solid barriers there so they can't stare at each other, you make pogo stick dogs. <laughs> and we don't want pogo stick dogs, so we still have to give them a choice. Uh, so that was under construction. We'll be able to talk about that more later. But we know because the ASPCA is funding it that we expect that they're going to have vast improvements to outcomes uh, for those animals. So this was a facility in New Mexico before and then after renovation of that same space. Again, huge improvements that dog did not like the power for that different solutions for different dogs. So these are full, more fully enclosed housing units. Um, these are kind of the same old runs, but much improved um, than they were before with uh, better visibility, better materials, hiding panels, so the dogs can retreat and hide if needed, and um, much better lighting. You know, you can see the vast improvements to lighting. Uh, that's the same skylight, but just the, the changing of the ceiling material so that reflects more light. We drop this noise control panel over top of the runs to reduce the reverberation in that space. It made a huge difference. There's also noise control on top of it, so we get a lot of benefit from that. And again, they see fantastic outcomes from this. Measurable 25% increase in adoptions after that renovation. Uh, this one was a little hard. I didn't have a good before and after, but the point of this renovation was uh, much more appropriate materials, a lot more natural light, 
and better housing. So again, those are going to be the things we're going to focus on primarily. And then this is the last new study I have for you. This is the ASPCA facility in New York City, on 91st Street. They actually purchased um, a boarding kennel. So they would not have built this facility initially. But they purchased a boarding kennel and they were using it for rehabilitating the dogs that came through the New York City Police Department. And as far as dogs go, those are the really, really toughest ones to help. A lot of them have been in basements, they've been, they had no positive interactions with human beings, they haven't touched ground, they haven't seen the sky. Um, so it's really, it's really hard on them. Um, New York is incredibly space constrained. You know, construction is $1,200 a square foot. So we really have to make some conscientious decisions. Uh, this is the model of the space we created out of that same square footage that they had. Um, the idea was that this was a spa-like environment for these dogs that were coming in from these very difficult situations. These dogs did not want big kennels. And again, housing has to serve the dog. These dogs have been chained, they've been in crates. They didn't want big kennels. They were, they were shut down, they were scared. And they needed small, calm, spa-like spaces. And so that's what we um, work on creating for them. One of the most interesting things, and I don't, I don't have any professional photos of this yet because it just opened. Um, so these are just some snapshots. Is the idea of this, this frosted moon-shaped panel. And it's the same idea that the dog has a place to retreat or a place to come forward. There are no floating human heads that go down the hallway. We also looked at offsetting these um, so that the dogs are not staring at each other. And we really worked on noise control in the space. Um, one of the most important components when you're using a lot of glass is recognizing that canines interact with their world through their nose. And it's really not fair to put them in glass boxes where they can't sniff out. So we wanted to create this really calm environment for these dogs, but at the same time allow them this very important interaction <laughs> with the outside world. <laughs> there you see that hole of what it's for. The nice thing is they can also use that for feeding treats through and just showing these dogs that the people mean well. Um, so every time they see a human, they get a treat. Um, and this has been, you know, they just opened this facility, but this gives you an idea of the gamut of things that are going on out there. And just my closing thing is we all know that a tired dog is a happy dog. Yeah. And one of the most important things that all the pack volunteers do is exercise these dogs. And it's so incredibly important to allowing them to be comfortable in their housing. So in addition to that renovation, those new areas, we're also creating more appropriate exercise areas for all these different dogs so that they can get out, blow off steam, and just be dogs. I got one question. Now those pictures, I didn't see any hoses for cleaning. <laughs> <laughs> we, we carefully photographed them just to hide the hoses, but no, they all have them. They're all hosed down facilities oh, okay. for sure. In fact, the ASPCA was really kind of wound up about that. Um, they didn't want to look at the hose, so we created this fancy little box where it was um, kind of holds down underneath that okay. box. So. So the next piece is, is about sort of how this all pulls together because, because one of the things that, you, that you're hearing about are, are that it's not just about the, the building or the inhabitants of the building, in this case are, are the pets that are in our care and custody or the people who are using the building, our rescue partners, our volunteers, <coughs> folks who are coming in for adoption, um, as well as our staff. But it's also about the processes that we have in place. And one of the things that, that has been a big theme um, since I um, asked Kristen to take on the challenge of PAC has been to relook at some of the things that we've always done because we've always done them that way. And between her and her team, said Justin, the whole nine yards, really start to scrub some of them and to think about also the fact that once we break ground, it is going to be horribly disruptive. It's going to be horribly disruptive for the animals, for our employees, for our volunteers, for everyone. And so we need to start putting 
trying out some of these processes in uh, as a way of um, sort of piloting. So I'm going to turn it over to Kristen, and then I'm going to show you a slide that I spent a lot of time making, and so I want you guys to see. That was a very nice slide. So before I go into some of the um, accomplishments and opportunities, I just wanted to say, you know, there's that old saying, I think those of us that work at PAC in any capacity understand it more than a lot of people, is that the only constant is change. So we go through so much change, and when you really think about it, that is the reason why PAC has progressed to the place that it has in the last several years. And that is how we are going to continue to progress and get to that place we all want PAC to be. So we know that we need to make some changes. And we have really been looking a lot, and I can speak for the last year and a half since I've been around, I know you guys have been at it a whole lot longer, but we've done um, quite a few things that have been really successful. So the first is our community cap project, which um, I know it wasn't necessarily universally loved initially, but our first year has already demonstrated that it was absolutely the right thing for this community. Our live release like, rate for cats has gone up 35% just in this year. Um, we have seen our intake in cats drop 20% this first year that the project is in place. So it has been a huge success for us, and it will continue because we were able to secure some funding to move this program at least a couple of years past um, when our project with Best Friends ends. So that's really... <laughs> uh, so that is one thing that we, we were able to pilot, obviously we loved, and we're able to continue that. Um, we also have funded, through a generous donation to the Friends of Human Animal Care Center, several new positions. So we have our Adoptions Marketing Coordinator and, the best part, some money for marketing, which is super exciting for us. And that's helping to drive traffic to the shelter. It's also helping to just raise our profile and our image in the community. So we're hoping that we can continue that as well. We have our cat care leads. For our poor cats who don't always maybe get as much attention from everyone, we have two part-time staff that it's their job to ensure their health, their well-being, and that they're being monitored. And then we also um, have funded, let me back up, through our partnership with No Kill Pima County, they really brought something that is critical to PAC success, and that's diversion through the help desk. And, yeah, we <laughs> That has been really game-changing for us and it demonstrated what diversion can do to support the shelter and so we do have one part-time funded position that is building that program or contributing to it and also we have just recently found two different funding sources that will help us continue to grow diversion in the next few years and bring in some folks for uh, a phone bank customer service helpline that will also help us piloting uh, perhaps some admissions by appointment, especially while we're in the new facility and we're during construction. So we will have those things in place within the next, mm, we'll have them January. <laughs> by January. Um, another thing I want to highlight, which you all know about, but is the change that we did in our medical and veterinary team. Mm -hmm. So before we had one staff veterinarian, and then we contracted with two veterinarians part-time, and they provide a lot of our spinal surgeries. And one of the things that we changed shortly after I started was that we dismissed the contracts and we hired two new staff veterinarians for a total of three. And when we did that, we actually increased by over double the amount of veterinary time that we have each week. And we did that at a savings to our budget. So that money gets to be reinvested into life-saving programs, medications, or things that we need for our pets. And those are the types of changes that we're continuing to look at and implement. Uh, this one's the most exciting. <laughs> um, and you guys get to hear it first. Uh, we also know that our, one of our um, biggest areas where we struggle is in behavior and training, uh, evaluation, placement for, um, for our dogs. And um, we also secured some funding to implement a training and behavior program starting in so, um, It's not huge. It's not probably what we would all want, but it's those stepping stones that we need. We can start to implement that, start to see some improvement and some savings, and then, you know, the sky's the limit from there. Uh, we are starting to pilot in the next couple of weeks our working cap program, so uh, we're really excited about that as well with some additional help from Best Friends to, to fund some cages. Uh, we are going to, hopefully the next couple of weeks, see if that is everything we believe it to be, and I think it will be. Uh, and then last 
our enforcement unit. We've seen a lot of changes throughout the shelter and everything else that we're doing. And, um, you know, enforcement maybe hasn't gotten all of the love and attention that it needs to be the best that it can be. And we are really focusing on helping to move that unit as well. So we've been able to send some folks to training over the last six months or so, so we can be updated on the newest, most, you know, the best practices possible, and we'll continue to reevaluate enforcement and see where we can make changes there as well. So, I mean, the last thing I want to say is that I think the most dangerous thing that we can all do is remain stagnant. Um, we owe the community and the pets in our community, um, we owe them that change. It can be really scary, and it can, and sometimes we may try something, and it might not be the right thing. But what we owe our community and our pets is to keep trying to be better. And so we will continue to evaluate best practices. We will continue to consult with experts, um, and then we'll continue to evaluate that up against our community and its individual and unique needs, so that we can make the best decisions we possibly can. And I think that uh, everyone in this room is on the same page with that because that's why you all give your time and all of your efforts to pack. So so the, so I'm going to ask you to send your cards forward. Um, I'm going to ask our panelists to sit at the table here so that we can start taking some questions. We have about 20 minutes uh, for that process. But I want to share with you something that I think is one of the things that, that, that that Kristen and her team and I spend a lot of time is is trying to break this down. I'm not, I don't know anything about about running an animal care facility, but I do know a lot about how we improve processes to deliver better services. Um, animal arts, if you could sit up there too, just because we love you. Um, and we so, so I break down the process. I break down the, of course it's an animation model. I break it down into three things. The input, the inputs, the animals that come in, the sheltering that we do, and the output. And if we, and if we think about breaking it down into those pieces, then it starts being something that we can actually accomplish. Of course, underpinning everything is our volunteers, our rescue partners, and uh, yo, know, Kristen was not incorrect in saying it was a game changer for us uh, to the relationship with Joe Kilpima County and the diversion at the door, um, as well as with our staff. I have an incredible team of people who spend way too much time thinking about this uh, out at that facility. I'm gonna walk through each of those really briefly. So in terms of the inputs and the animals coming into our care facility, that's where the diversion efforts are really, really important. And that's where I believe that we will need to be moving into scheduled, you know, appointment, surrender type of, um, uh, type of an environment. That's also where we really have put a lot of spay and neuter resources. Sorry. Um, and that's uh, decreasing our, our community investment in spay and neuter has really decreased the number of animals that are coming into our facility. And we're going to continue that. And we're going to continue with the community cats program. Again, we have funds to do that for the next five years. Outreach owner and support. How do we support owners to be successful? And, and how do we involve enforcement in terms of facilitating the returns in a positive way, right? So, so that it doesn't seem punitive. So that maybe they can get them back to the homes that those animals were lost from rather than bring them back into the facility. We want to try to shortcut that as much as possible. Um, in terms of the sheltering function, we've really made huge investments, huge investments. I'll tell you that people, I'm not the most popular person. I, we actually have three veterinarians on staff, um, and, and some people say that's too many, but I believe that that's the right thing that we have to do for the animals that are in our care and custody, and I believe that that will facilitate, oh, that will, thanks man, that that will facilitate um, getting those animals out. Um, we also are really carefully thinking about how do we maximize disease control. See, that's where I, my experiences really come from. I'm a, I'm a gynecologist, I'm a physician. I know about how we control disease in population environments. And I know that we can really impact 
the, the, um, the uh, adoptability of our animals if we have a healthier environment where they are not getting kennel cough, where they are not developing diseases that they might not have walked in the door with. So for me, that's hugely important. And I really think that the facility design is going to facilitate that. And that's what I've learned from our friends at, at, um, at Corette and Animal Arts, and, and really sort of thinking through how does the design, how does the materials really impact that. Uh, enrichment and training. So, so how do we increase the adoptability of our pets? It's by creating an enriched environment where they are going to be much more likely to be uh, the kind of animals that we want to show off. Uh, and then, um, how do we fast track animals into um, from the time that they get in our hands to the time that they are placed in um, in in a home, in a forever home? And then finally, on the output side, this is really about the things that we do to maximize our outputs. What are the things that we need to do with our partners to increase our adoptions? specifically of those animals that might have some special needs. And that's where some of our rescue partners are really kind of critical. Um, some of those animals are not highly desirable, at, at least initially, and so it becomes kind of a, a challenge for them. That's okay. Sorry, I, I had it in um, animation mode. And <laughs> That's okay, just leave it there. Uh, one of the things that we've really invested ourselves in, one of the things that has been kind of a big innovation that this management team has made has been to start thinking strategically about doing off-site adoptions. We are not located in the best part of town in order to maximize walk-through traffic. We just aren't. And we are locked in that facility. We are locked in that land. We are not going to be able to be anywhere else. So how do we encourage off-site adoptions? How do we facilitate? How do we make it easier to do those things? Enhancing, enhancing foster placement and support. How do we help our, foster, um, our, our fosters be successful in fostering? Um, I, again, not a huge animal person in my background, but I, I have three, uh, two dogs and, and uh, I'm sorry, two cats and a dog, you know, all of them from our shelter, obviously. Um, and, and I've been through the foster process as a consumer, um, and I sort of, sort of know how it feels like to kind of feel like you're out there on your own. So really thinking about that. Optimizing our rescue partnerships. You know, our rescue, our rescue partners have different capacities and different interests, and we have to help them be successful in what they're doing. Um, and try to figure out how we how we line them up. And then finally, how do we support adopters? You know, so that so that once we make that placement in somebody's home, that placement sticks. Our our stick I call it stick rate. Our our rate of return is actually very low, but it could be even lower. Um, and what are the things that we can do to facilitate that? As Kristen mentioned, one of the huge things is that um, we. We have a very substantial $3.1 million um, set of bequests, two bequests that were left to pack that are specifically to do highly innovative things over the next five years. And Kristen and myself and the management team at PAC have developed a five-year plan for what we're going to do with those resources. That, that's about supporting um, you know, um, our uh, folks who are adopting our animals, that is about providing behavioral training, that's about supporting the cat, community cats program after the money runs out. Um, those are the strategic investments that we're making uh, in this area because I think at the end of the day, um, we are all best served when all these pieces work together. So that's kind of showing off my slide. Um, but then <laughs> this is the time for us to sort of start thinking about what are the what are some of the key questions? Do we have the question cards? We got them. Oh, super. We got them all. Oh, thank you. Okay, okay. So, one of the things that, that was really helpful from I think Marty's presentation and that I think addressed a, an issue that was a really big one, but I just want to make sure that everybody is sort of understanding it of it was the, the issue of the budget piece and, and whether it made sense to you the way that he sort of addressed it. And so I'm, I'm hoping to, you know, but, um, Can I just say something? Yeah. Um, I think that the, the 
sort of, but they're all very different, so. Okay. So, um, a comment about um, communal cap housing and, and getting Coretz sort of perspective on where group housing may be appropriate, where it might not be appropriate, an animal arts perspective on that. I think um, I'll back into it a little bit because more, for, for animals coming into a facility, the first thing that we want to do is, um, is to get them into individual housing so we can make an assessment on their well-being, how they're doing, what kind of uh, animal they are. Um, and then, if the, if the animal um, is not going to move quickly through the system, that's when we tend to use communal housing for, for cats. So get them, if there's going to be there for a period of time or if they're going to show best in a group housing type situation, it, then to get them into a group housing situation. Cats are unique in that um, not all cats like to be with other cats. Uh, we really like the opportunities we can provide for cats in sort of a room space, but not all cats get along. So actually when we do group house, we need to provide cats with more space than we would in an individual housing unit. So, um, and cats in group houses need to be managed and observed, and they're actually, it, it takes more time to have cats in group housing um, and to ensure their health and well-being. So it's a... Balance. It's a balance. Yeah. Here's another question that sort of comes up that is kind of derivative of that. Talk about the dimensions of adequate, adequately sized double compartment housing. We had lots of conversations about about what is what are the right dimensions for different kinds of animals. Do you want to sort of address that? Sure. Um, this is like is, a is this, this is a test to see if I've got the latest correct information. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, I think there are, what we want to do is create flexibility. And I think it di differs a little bit depending on whether we're talking about cats or dogs. So addressing cats, um, the very minimum sounds like is nine and a half square feet uh, per individually housed cat, which is basically a four foot housing unit. Uh, so in our plans, we don't have anything that's shorter than a four foot housing unit at double compartment for a cat. but. There are always circumstances where larger housing is a lot more useful for flexibility. Um, and we also want to think about um, vertical compar um, compartmentalization or allowing for vertical um, environments as well as horizontal. So there are some ways you can open housing units so that the cat can have more space during certain times of year. Is that reasonable? Yep. And then for dogs, the challenge is that we have a lot of social ideas about how dogs should be housed. Um, so it's actually really hard to parse with dogs, but all of the dog housing units that we are providing are um, more than adequate to meet their needs humanely, um, to give them a humane amount of space inside and outside. They're oversized for that, um, and to prevent problems like happy tail where they hit their tails against the side of the compartments so to be adequately wide as well. Um, we find as we look across the globe that every culture houses dogs differently. So what we need to go back to is what a dog really needs and that also depends on the size and personality of that dog. There's a, quite a few questions about specifically the, the guillotine, guillotine doors and also about kind of how you select high quality materials and, and design and how, how you decide on the selection of those durable materials and, and how that is all factored in? Well, we assume that um, you are going to need to operate this facility on the same budget um, that you're currently operating. And you'll get a lot of benefits by using system operations and materials that are a lot easier for you to use. Um, but that said, we also know that shelters are abusive environments. We have animals, and animals eat things before lunch, you know, like <laughs> the door handle or whatever. And so we're going to start with the most um, durable materials that we can use in animal housing environments, um, which include stainless steel um, or uh, anodized aluminum components for housing. And we're going to compare those most durable options against the budget, uh, budget that we're using. We're also going to compare them against the, the um, cleaning systems you use. So um, we have to match our materials to our cleaning protocols. 
uh, which is very important, and different cleaning uh, chemicals react with different sorts of materials. So all those things are going to be looked at. But for this type of facility, we would basically assume that it's going to be used very hard every day, 24-7, and start with that assumption. Um, the housing components have come a long way uh, since your, obviously since the chain link and even some of the remodels that you've done more recently. So. Um, there's also some questions about specifically in the in the sort of kennel design about making sure that um, that um, we don't close up dogs that they, they, they the sort of coverings aren't so solid that they can't see through a lot of the things that you showed in your before and after period pictures had kind of these mixed designs where there were like bars and then there was a solid space or a frosted window space and and uh, is that how you're thinking about what you're thinking about for this facility? Yes, and again, I, uh, we're going to want to get packs and put on their um, their needs in different spaces as well as Corette's best information about making those decisions. Um, recognizing that dogs are, are not people, you know, they do interact with the nose, so we have to keep the, the smell component in all housing units. Um, and uh, cats as well. We don't want to put animals in caging, for example, that doesn't ventilate. So those will, those decisions will, will play in as well. So it's probably going to be a mix um, that's really based on the behavior of the animal and that particular circumstance. So for example, um, when cats first come into a facility and they're um, most likely to be stressed, it's really helpful for them to have a hiding panel on a portion of that unit, housing unit they're in, so you can still look in there to evaluate them, make sure they're okay, but they have a place to hide and that actually has a really big impact on how well they do. So. The, um, <clears throat> there's also questions about sort of the kind of uh, air circulation and ventilation in the facility and how you come up with, you know, the best, what are the best practices in terms of um, so keeping the air healthy for the animals that are in our shelter facility? Well, a lot of it's going to start first with um, ventilation. So ventilation has to be way above what you would see in an office building or in a room like this. And the difference is that we don't think anybody is urinating in this room, although I, I could be wrong. <laughs> 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 um, and, and also with all the cleaning we do, you know, there's a lot going on in an animal environment and needs to have a lot of fresh air. So that's obviously a sustainability concern. So we're Lion Space is going to be leading a charge on, you know, balancing the energy requirements of the building versus the ventilation needs. So it really starts from ventilation. That also assumes that we're not recirculating air through the space because then you sort of defeat the purpose. So there will be fresh air coming in and exhausting from those animal spaces, and we're working on the the details of that discussion right now. There's some, uh, Kristen and, and Jose, there's some sort of functional questions and, and, and some of the operational questions are, we may or may not be able to answer because, because they're still kind of very much in, in the mix right now. Um, but, but folks, um, somebody sort of has a, uh, a um, uh, sort of an observation about our, our chronic laundry sort of challenges. And how, yes. and I know that that's something that you have managed for us, and, and how do you think that the new facility may make that better or worse, or none of the above? <laughs> oh, I can't, I can't imagine it will be worse. <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely going to be better. So I guess, for me, I'm not actually sure how many units we're going to have in the new shelters. So is that something that we even know yet, in terms of... Well, we, we program, they currently have two washers and two dryers. We'll program for three washers and three dryers. We'll have to evaluate the existing units to see whether there's any value in saving them or whether they'll be replaced completely. Um, we've got a lot to learn from within Pima County because they just did, um, I, I'm not sure, how exactly it happened, but we know that they've done new laundry facilities for the prison, um, and there's a lot, you know, that's a comparable use, and that it's a constant use facility that's generating a lot of laundry, and they're sort of always on. Um, one thing that we 
have planned and that we discussed as we were working with Animal Arts and Correct today was perhaps having multiple locations where laundry can be done um, and having adequate facilities in the clinic so that the clinic won't be dependent on the laundry because right now they're operating on a residential unit that is just uh, undersized and inadequate so then those end up breaking and they end up going into the main shelter. So um, the short story is we have in our program from, from input that we received during those workshops, we're planning on doubling the capacity of the industrial um, wash and dryers. And the other point too I think is, although it seems small, but if we're not operating out of the tent anymore, um, the need for as much bedding also can go down, especially this time of year. So we'll have increased capacity for laundry and then hopefully at least a, a reduced amount of laundry. One of the questions that, that, that was articulated that I heard a couple of times before, and, and given that our consultants are here, I, I want you to hear from them because I know that I've phrased, I've phrased the answer to this. Uh, somebody asked, why the middlemen? Architects, um, why not hire the architects with experience directly? Talk about how animal arts and how correct animal shelter work because there's this perception that, that you guys can just come down and build this for us. We, we absolutely need to work as a team, especially with a, a beast like this project. Uh, we, we need wide space, we need their leadership, their knowledge of the climate, um, their knowledge of the local environment. Um, you know, Mike's knowledge of the pack is invaluable. Um, and that's a normal situation for us, is to work in collaboration <coughs> with others because um, we're all doing kind of different things, you know what I mean? Uh, Corette is working on really the operational and animal health pieces and we're making sure the floor drain works. And, um, and Lion and Space is coordinating all of these different people who not, include not just us, but um, their mechanical engineering team and all the other components, uh, civil engineering and all the other components that go into this project. Really making it happen, mind and space will make it happen. <laughs> yeah, and I'd like to add, add to that. Uh, as the um, Department of Pima County that hires the design team, we really need somebody who's local to be responsive. If, if there's a construction issue that needs we need an answer on in two hours, you know, we don't want somebody in Denver or San Francisco to say, well, I can get a flight there maybe on Monday. And we need somebody who's there, who's responsive, and who's there can get can get the work done on demand, and, and, and that's what and that's why we really it's critical on almost all of our projects that we have somebody local. Even having somebody in Phoenix can be challenging because it's three o'clock on a on a Thursday, and you know we can't get anybody there that day. But you know they can get there, and, and Lion Space has been very very responsive and meetings and. Um, as many meetings as we have, I can't imagine, I think our out-of-town consultants would pretty much live in the airport, so um, it's, it's critical that we have a team, uh, a local component, um, architect leading that, leading that charge and kind of keeping everything grounded. Kristen, um, there's, a, there's actually a few questions about sort of, given sort of a, a larger footprint for our facility, how do we, how do we service all these pods, how do we make sure that there are staffing Talk about the processes that you guys are thinking, Jose, uh, in terms of how you're going to manage human resources in order to manage what is what is arguably a, a significantly larger footprint. Yeah, um, you know we do rely a lot on inmate labor, and just so you guys know, we've also been working closely with the sheriff's department for. Um, how we'll work with that component of our labor force, which is probably not necessarily the direction you were going with that, but it is a key part of building this building because we know that we don't, at this point, function without our inmate support and our volunteer support. So that is certainly being considered. Um, and more generally, we certainly will be faster and more efficient when we're working in the types of environments and the new types of uh, channels that we will have. 
Um, so we can we can be faster. It won't take us as long. But I'm going to let Jose talk about how we actually move people through. Yeah, like even right now, you'll probably see within the next like six months a lot more shelter staff moving to the floor because I'm always looking at operationally how do we get more people on the floor to be with the animals. Um, because I want staff to be as much of a presence as inmates and volunteers. And so some of the things we're doing is like having... <laughs> so, so some things we're doing are um, actually starting this coming week, we're going to have a canine care coordinator. So this is, you know, a 40 hour week person who's going to be on the floor, who's really going to be in charge of implementing, you know, the five freedoms bedding, just those little things that make a big deal, that are a big, make a big difference for the animals. Like you see a chihuahua with a big bucket. It's all those little things that take so much time away from adopting the animal. If we only had staff to do it, we could probably redirect some of the even volunteer resources into more adoption oriented things. So her name's Amanda. She starts in that role Sunday. Pat, um, who is doing foster, right now she's helping me in the shelter because we, we're <laughs> low on some staffing. She'll be focusing on cat care coordination. And then we did get some extra staff, um, additional staff, thank you. <laughs> and so a lot of those staffers will actually be on the floor. And so their whole job will be dedicated. So at any plus, we kind of removed, as most of you know, in the shelter, if we were low staffed, then we didn't have anyone for customer service. We're kind of separating the two, so not only will we have Ellie on the floor more because we have Mark who's doing off-site adoption, so Ellie will be on the floor, yay. <laughs> and then um, of the six staff that we were graciously given, we worked really hard to prove that we could utilize that by offsetting overtime. So it's not just more money, it's money that was being spent that we're just kind of redirecting. Um, two of those positions are going into live release. So now we'll have two dedicated adoption counselors plus Ellie. So that's those people on the floor, plus two people that we'll have um, from the six, and then Amanda and Pat. So we're already starting that transition of more staff on the floor. And I'd like to add too, we're looking at, um, I know one of the big issues now is not enough computers, not conveniently located, and not, you guys can't access what you need to. And so certainly in the design, we've looked at having those workstations around. Uh, Chameleon actually doesn't allow the access that we need, but we have found a way with IT that we're um, working on that they're writing for us that we can get access uh, to the information that you need at the workstations as well. The, there was a, a few questions that, that, that are about sort of the co-location of, of um, kennels and, and animal showing spaces close to adoption areas. I, I think we may, are we too early in the process to be talking about those kinds of details? Because I think that you guys have put a, some thought into into the proximity, how you know having spaces that show off animals close to the places where you're trying to do your adoptions. Yes, this is a challenge that uh, I think we're coming much closer to really having some very good answers to. Um, you know, Lion Space has done a, an incredible job with a pretty challenging site in terms of some constraints. And also, um, just the type of housing we want to give for the dogs, um, indoor outdoor housing, needs some breathing room around it so that you don't have barking mania going on. So we're kind of still massaging that a little bit in terms of bringing those proximities as close as they can be to the, the adoption counseling um, components and adoption components. So I think it's a really coming into focus pretty well. So. In terms of, um when you talk about, there's a couple questions about um, the public art piece and how that is managed and what those resources are for. Um, yeah, as I said uh, earlier, all county, Pima County projects are required to have a 1% of our project budget attributed to um, a public art component. Um, and our, we're directed to uh, use TPAC to lead that charge, the Tucson Pima Arts Council. And so about uh, three three months ago, we put out an open call um, across the, I think across the world to any artist to submit. We actually got, we got 46 proposals and we got one as far as one from England and maybe one other, one from Spain, yeah. Um, and we have, and let me back up, that committee is comprised of um, Henry Tom from Land Space, myself, uh, Board of Supervisors appointed members, city city council appointed members, and a couple artists from Tucson. 
Um, so anyway, we met, we evaluated the 46 proposals, we shortlisted four, and we will bring them in for interviews. Once we have them, and it's a qualifications base, once we have the, what we believe is the most qualified artist, um, we will introduce them to the design team and we'll start to look at opportunities. We're planning on probably having, or planning on having um, some type of open house um, for the artists to kind of hear from all the different stakeholders what the, what, what the concerns are out there, what kind of messages we might want to convey in the artwork. Um, one important piece we're also looking at is um, the, and some of the artists we like were ones that did more than just <coughs> a sculpture in a courtyard. Can we, can we do more with it? Could we, um, could, you know, just something simple as art that's seating, you know, we kind of more, but kind of double our bang for the buck is what I kept saying. And there's, you know, screen walls, things that shade areas, but also our art. So that's something that the committee was, um, was high on as well. So we're, we're in the middle of that process. We should have the artist on board, I would say, um, beginning of the year. And we did have a volunteer representative on that committee as well, Michael Block. That's true. And who's that? Oh, yeah. uh, there was lots of questions about uh, about um, some of the operational budget, and so and so I'm going to take those questions. Um, a lot of them about so when do we start the behavioral piece, and when do we start doing the um, enhanced diversion and stuff. So so. Um, off the top of my head, um, I can't tell you exactly when, but what I can tell you is that um, that it, all of this stuff starts, the, the clock starts ticking January 1st. The, the, the proposal that I brought to the county administrator essentially said that effective July, January 1st, we needed to make some really important changes precisely because I expected the construction phase to be very disruptive. Um, Kristen, Jose, the team out at PAC, we've all sort of lost sleep about what's this going to do to our, the number of people walking in for adoptions? What's this going to do to our volunteers who are trying to walk through a construction zone? So, so I can tell you, uh, and again, I can't remember exactly how I phased it, but, but, it, but it is effective January 1st that we start that process. Um, the behavioral um, rehabilitation, I remember that we we took pains to not call a trainer um, because we didn't want to be seen as competing with the private sector. We talked about the um, uh, pet resource center, a, a kind of an adoption support, foster support function. Um, the um, the I can tell you that the community spay and neuter program, the community cat program, that is um, the one that is furthest out. That's about three years out. When we exhaust our our current money, that's when we start putting that money in the pump. Part of this, part of the reason we did it this way, though, is because a we want to accrue some interest on this money that was left to us. B we wanted to see if we can challenge donors to come up with some more resources for some of these things. Already we've been successful. PetSmart Charities has, in the last, gosh, month and a half, uh, given us almost two hundred and fifty thousand um, dollars for um, offsite adoptions for a vehicle for off-site adoptions. I'm trying to remember what the other things were The for. resource center and the national adoption. So, so it has given us a, and so, and so by making an initial strategic investment on our part, we hope to challenge some, philanth some philanthropy to bring in some more resources. So it, it's not that, I could spend the $3.1 million on day one, but I don't think that that's a smart way of doing it. And I think that we need to sort of think about long-term sustainability. The thing that Kristen has made me painfully aware of is that unless we think about this in the long-term and systematically, uh, these are just blips, right? We, we can't sustain these changes unless we make some wholesale community investments in this property. So uh, I can tell you that most of these investments, or many of these investments, are going to start January 1st. So we've, uh, we are getting together, Kristen, myself, the director of finance, um, and some other folks are getting together in terms of figuring out the, the timeline for the, that implementation actually next week or the week after. So it is very much um, something that we, is a high priority. Um, signage, um, lots, of, lots of comments about signage and about how do we make, how do we make the, the signage more visible from the road, how do we enhance the signage within the facility. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Um, anyone? <laughs> <laughs> well, our, uh, 
Light and Space's approach is to um, make the architecture as clear as possible, and that's one thing that's driving how we are configuring the intake and adoption lobbies. Um, you see some facilities where that is where those are separated, which has uh, can have certain advantages as far as animal flow. Um, but here we really want to make clear wayfinding, so we're sort of putting those on either side of an entry space so that um, it will be very clear that we can sort of funnel people to one point but make it clear that intake is happening on this side and adoption is happening on the other. So that will be reinforced with signage, but our primary um, goal in every type of project we do is to use the architecture to really aid in wayfinding. For those of you that have been out to the Desert Museum, I think that that's perhaps a, a, a good example. There, um, we used a bright purple spine that is a shading element, casts interesting shadows on the ground, but that really is a wayfinding element to bring people, to lead them to the front door in, in a building that, um, because of the site and moving through the site, maybe the front door isn't immediately apparent. So using architectural elements to really aid with wayfinding, but at PAC specifically, um, we've talked about the potential to use color to differentiate between intake and adoptions, and the potential for that to come out to the parking lot. Um, we're even splitting the parking lot into an intake side and adoption side, not that that won't not that people can't park on the other side, but trying to reinforce that, that um, clarity of zoning, um, even at that level. Um, so all that will be reinforced with, with clear signage and the presence on the street is at the intersection of uh, Sweetwater and Silver Bell is definitely something we are, are thinking of and envisioning uh, more of a monument sign than just the metal panel sign that's out there right now. The, the as attractive as it is. Um, <laughs> the, uh, there's a question about sort of how we how we solicited input, how stakeholder input, volunteer input has been involved. I actually started the exercise of counting because Light and Space did a beautiful job of documenting all the all the feedback that we've gotten. We can actually tell what feedback is from our external stakeholders, volunteers, rescue organizations, others. Um, and how much is from us? We we the team, uh, Jose uh, and Kristen and myself, and, and 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 I have not finished doing that count because there's too damn many uh, comments that we've gotten back. <laughs> Light Space has it memorialized in their document, um, and I challenge you know, whoever wants to help me do the counting. I, I think it's really impressive um, the number, the sheer volume of comments that we've gotten from people and. And a lot of times when we get comments, we, we won't be able to do every single thing, but we incorporate it in our thinking. That's what I see Marty and what I see our friends from Line and Space doing, is, is we incorporate the concept in our thinking. Lots of stuff about outside spaces for dogs. Lots of stuff about indoor, outdoor sheltering has gotten incorporated into our thinking. You know? Lots of stuff about the cat area and how do we make that um, more uh, a place that, that is a healthier environment has been incorporated into the thinking. So even though not every single comment might be represented on the final plan, I, it has been considered. It, it's actually been looked at. It's been memorialized in their documents. Um, as we do this, we continue to memorialize it and, and track this feedback. We have a website that people are sending comments to. So uh, we, we're getting a ton of feedback. Um, and and it's good, and, and we want to continue to have that kind of feedback. Um, the the there's a there's a question that is asked with regards to the budget that I think that I think is is worth sort of looking at. Um, and and again, you know, I've never built a facility like this, and so for me, this is this process has been kind of interesting. Um, but one of the things that I think is really, really critical as we as we look at the at the at the budget, 
one of the things that, that, I, that I think is particularly critical as I look at this budget um, is, that, is that these contingency funds, this 1.7 million, I mean, yeah, 1.7, so, so what is that for? So, so that, that is for us to, to deal with things that might come up in the process of construction. But this isn't just some sort of slush fund, right? Um, that's gonna go to buy me a Corvette. <laughs> what, what happens is that, is that in their design process, and, and Marty owns this part of the, and, and, and Mike owned this part of it, there are different places in that timeline where that contingency fund is looked at. And as that contingency fund is being not used, those resources are put back into the project, into the construction, into, into the, um, the, the, the overall um, space. So, so this is not, this 1.7 is not, is not a slush fund to give to my friends. Um, it, is, it is something that we need to build in just in case we find Indian remains. Yeah. So, so realize that, that that public works building got was really challenged when all of a sudden they found a cemetery there, and you had to deal with that. And that wasn't something that was planned for, and it exceeded the contingency budget. By the way, um, we could really find something big that could sort of blow our budget. Um, we believe that we've thought through all the possible things that could come up. And we build a contingency fund to address those. But that's what that's what that is for. The other part that sometimes folks don't realize when when we're building um, is that we have to the, the putting in utilities for a large scale building is a supremely expensive piece. And then the other part that's really super important is that and is that to have the expertise of Lion Space and Coret and Animal Arts at the table actually cost And we, I believe, it's a good investment of that money. And that's part of the reason why we've dedicated that amount for design. And I will make no apologies for that because I believe that the building we build this in the next year will need to serve us for the next 50 years. And so I think that that's, that I realize that it doesn't feel like it's for the animals, but at the end of the day, by having their design expertise, by having their technical um, the in input and knowledge at the table, I think that's the way we're going to be able to make this building be something that makes sense in the long run. Dr. Garcia, may I just have a yes, dialogue with you? The reason I'm the one asking that question, pretty much, or maybe other people as well, Sure. but I really, really need, as I said on my card, a crisp, clear answer and we're your friends. All of us in here are on your side. But the media or the critics or somebody really needs a really clear answer. And I'm not asking you to throw anyone under the bus about the past or the present. I'm not blaming anybody in here. But we need a crisp, clear answer on the timeline from how we went from 17.8 being enough for a new shelter to now 22 million not being enough. We just no. need, we, because we are sure. here defenders. Yeah, we have the problems on the street and in the shelter. And Talk Nancy, and I think we, we should continue the, the dialogue. And, Somewhere and, I need an answer. No, no, and, and I think one of the things that's really important is that we realize that we're all kind of on the same team, right? Uh, there are a lot of people who really would love to, uh, I get hate mail about this project, about, about not wanting to build this project, about how we should be spending $22 million on something else. So, so I believe, Nancy, that, that this is, this is the right amount of resources to build the right size facility. And I want every penny. I want all 22 million to go there. I just, you know, 30 some percent of the population and the poverty level in Tucson and people criticizing us during the campaign for not spending all the money on you pick and answer of children, right. whatever. All of us in here care about children and everyone else, but we have to be able to defend this thing. And I don't feel right now that I can because I, I, you know, explain it to me like I'm four years old. At, at the end of the day, know. at the end of the day, the delta, the difference between that 17 and 22, has a lot to do with these expenses that have to do with the acquisition of land, with design, with um, utility, the public art, and the contingency piece. And 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 we we will 
we will put that back into the project. Just be prepared because, like yes. I said, we're your friends yes, on we your know side, that. Yes. and the people who aren't on our side are just going to want to pick it into shreds. Absolutely, and we absolutely, and we and we get. We want to help you. We we that's hear that. Yes, I know you. And that's why I'm here. I want to help the, you. And we we do. I, I was told, why aren't you building a clinical facility for children? That's what. That's kind of a common kind of theme. Twenty-two million. I asked for four million in the bond election that we lost for a new clinic. Why can I take that four million out of this two twenty-two million? Well, because I believe this community has decided that this is a priority, and this community, and and this is a huge surprise, especially when you see how the last bond performed. This community overwhelmingly said that this was a priority in every single dis in every single precinct except one. It won, and not by a little margin. It won by wide margins. So I believe that people in general in Pima County really believe that we need to do something that changes, that's a game changer in terms of the care of the animals that are in our custody. So uh, I agree with you. I think we need to continue to develop language. The FAQs that we have are actually on the website, and we're going to continue to update them because, because sometimes the answers do change. And, the, and, and as we get closer to it, there will probably be less change, but we will continue to update those and make sure that you have the information. Jack, did you want to make a comment? I want to try to wrap up by 7.30, it's 7.26. No, I, the, the comment I was going to make was when there was a couple of slides back when we were talking about uh, how certain things like the adoptions are affecting you. <clears throat> Everything falls into the different into the categories that you made on your chart. I mean, that happened to fall into your outlook. Right. So you know, there's impacting, as you were showing, all the different things here. It's impacting one facet of that chart, whether it's input, stopping the amount of dogs and animals coming, animals, cats and dogs, or whether it's the output on the adoption side. So that's all I was going to make was a comment on how everything is falling into a category. I'm glad somebody appreciated my slide. <laughs> <laughs> but for me, it's all about process and, and, and and, and Kristen's team is really good at trying to say, what are the different pieces that, that go into those different processes? And I think that, that that's how we move into this kind of modern environment. Realize that we're not talking about a dog pound anymore. We're talking about a facility that's going to shelter animals and going to facilitate adoption. That's, that's the game changer here, folks. I mean, I, this is, you know, I, I would never guess that. I think what people may not realize, and I have in my prior life a little bit of experience in working with architectural design firms and projects, you can hire any number of architectural firms to build a building. You want to build an office building, you can hire lots of different people, and they're all qualified, and in the end, you're going to have an office building with X number of floors, and you can rent to companies and things like that. It's a specialized facility. So you need all those people who have that exact specialized knowledge of each aspect of this contributing to the project to make it a successful project. It's not just a building. It's not just a bigger shelter to house more dogs and bigger cats. That's a really good that's a really good comment because we could actually build a shell and just stick a lot of chain link kennels in there. And I don't think anybody in this anybody in this room would think that, that that's acceptable. I mean we put the tent up because we had no other choice, but we do not think that that's the highest level. So that's a great comment to, to sort of wrap up on. Understand that we will continue to reach out to you, um, and we will probably have another one of these sort of back and forth conversations, probably three or four months down the road, just to sort of give you a progress update and to hear your feedback. And, uh, and to hear the, some of the tough questions, that Nancy asked good questions, and I, and I think we do need to sort of be prepared for them. Um, that's part of the reason why our good friends from Line and Space have prepared kind of a, a, a got almost a handheld FAQ that's in the back uh, table. Please grab one, because it answers a lot of those questions. Exactly how many cat spaces do we currently have? versus how many do we project, exactly how many dog kennels do we have, versus how many we project. So please grab one of those on the way up. Please grab a, um, some, a snack so I don't eat all those chocolates on the way up. Um, and thank you for taking this 
Friday afternoon to share your thoughts and your input with us. And our eyes, our ears are, are open and our ears are really big. And we're trying to take all this. Kristen and I spend a lot of time trying to take, filter a lot of input and try to figure out how we convey it, communicate it constructively to our partners um, and, and the design team and, and our facilities management. But please keep that input coming because, because we know you're on the same side as we are. We know that we're all advocating for a better environment. Yes, ma'am. I want to make one comment. We visit hundreds of organizations and have visited hundreds of of organizations that are sheltering animals across the U.S. and actually across the world. We came here this summer, we talked about some ideas and put some things forth, and I have never been in a community where things have been gone from ideas to actionable items on the, these are big things that are getting done here, and they're, they're in the works for change, and I hope you realize, and it's hard because you only you have one facility, so you don't see this. But it is um, I must commend, commend this pack, pack, the community that you have, and the amount and willingness to move forward is tremendous. Thank you. Thank you so much.